Next episode, we got Tim Leary in the seat. Now, Tim is somebody that when I really started to make my jumps in real estate, 2019 to 2020, Tim was a member of the Perry Group at that time, which is where I got to know him. And to see this kid, I would say, like I definitely felt like I was older than Tim. I felt like I was selling a lot and he was still trying to figure out if he wanted to sell real estate. Right, That was my perception of Tim at the time. And, and over the last three years, we've done a couple of transactions together, but have taken a little while. This is the first time after doing those transactions where we actually took a couple of minutes, sat down, caught up with each other. And I'm blown away by where he's at. He's now leading a team in Salt Lake. I don't know how many agents they have, but they got a brand new swanky office in Salt Lake that looks unbelievable. And, and he has people that are looking up to him and people that are listening when he talks and i am super super excited for you guys to hear this episode he was super self-aware and super honest i think about some of the things that makes him unique as an agent and some of the things that he pays attention and some of the things that are important to him inside and outside of real estate but but really just who he is as a person so i'm super excited for you guys to hear from my friend tim larry I struggle with the structure and it's not even that I feel like it holds me back. Like I've gone through all of this. I've talked to my therapist about this many times, but it's not the structure. It's, it's like a certain level of freedom that I feel like I have to have. Like I, have you ever done the Brene Brown, the two trait thing where you kind of isolate what your two traits are that mean the most to you? No, highly recommend it, but it's, it starts off with a list. Gratitude, pride, like just goes through everything that you could feel, everything that you could be. And it says pick two and it's like, there's no shot. I'm going to be able to pick the two that describe me the best, but I, you, you work through it and you work through it and you finally get to the two. The, the first thing that is the most important to me is autonomy, right? If I don't have autonomy, it, my life doesn't work. That's, that's what I think where I'm able to find the harmony is when I have autonomy, mm. right? So as soon as I left the model home, my numbers tripled, right? As soon as I didn't have to be somewhere at a set time and, and be a certain way from the hours of eight to 11 or whatever the model home hours were, I, I was better. And, and that's just the reality of it, right? Yeah. But being in an environment where they encourage that is so beneficial. Yes. And, so and, and Edge is huge on on us running our business in a way that works for us as long as it still aligns with who they are as a company. Right? Yeah. I noticed that with you, right? Like when I think of a new construction agent, they're the one that you show up to and they're managing the model home and what's going on day to day you stepped out and I feel like truthfully that was a large part of your success was creating relationships within the real estate community, which a lot of people try and go against when they first start because they, especially from a builder perspective. Yeah. And they associate you with competition. They don't associate you with growth. And if I were to pinpoint one thing in your success, it was stepping out of the model home and creating something and, mostly creating that network and relationship with other real estate agents who could then bring you business. Well, I think that was the, that was the start. I think the evolution of it became, how can I, how can I not only try to network and build a relationship with, with the outside real estate agent community, but how can I create value? Right. When I kind of align, cause I think that that's what the really good agents, at least the really good agents that I enjoy working with do better than others is they create value for their buyers and sellers. And that's like after 10 or 12 episodes, however many episodes, what episode is this? 11. So after the first 10 episodes, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I've had is that the top agents, the people that are out there that are, that are working are, are hell bent on creating value for their buyers and their Mm -hmm. sellers. Yeah. And, and whatever that looks like, it's the people that are focusing on creating that value. That's different, right? Every agent's value proposition is different, but the agents that seem to be doing the best and having the best success are the ones that create value. Yeah. It's that, that creates long-term success. Uh huh. You can walk out, especially in the last two years and sell a house with zero experience Mm -hmm. and it was easy. Then you fall into the trap of it being easy. It was easy. It was happening and it made everything kind of a cluster for a long time, right? Yeah, because there was no separation between what is great and what adds value and what is just getting the deal done. Yeah. And even consumers didn't recognize that. Now we're transitioning back into the phase of real estate where there has to be value or you won't succeed. If you're not creating that value and honestly supporting and advising the way that you should as a real estate agent, there's a lot of money to be lost. There's a lot of relationships to be lost, but most importantly, you are the one who will be out of the business because yeah. you're not creating that value, which therefore creates long-term relationships, referrals, things like that. Well, if you've listened to us on the show at all, um, 
the number that we keep throwing around is somewhere, there's somewhere between 27 and 28,000 active licenses in the state of Utah right now. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the numbers, 25% of them have done one transaction or less in the last 12 months in a difficult, difficult market. That doesn't, that doesn't work if you're making the single biggest financial investment. You talked through what some of the negatives are, right? You can lose money. You can lose sleep. You can lose a whole bunch of things. There's such a value add though to using a real estate agent that's not a part-time person that does one deal every 12 months. When you use somebody that knows what they're doing, they're not just thinking about this purchase. They're thinking about the next one for you before you even know that that's what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. They're saying, hey, if you do this, then you can open up this, 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 and this, mm -hmm. right? They're able to show you outside of just the transaction what, what real estate can do for you as a consumer, which is insane. It's a different level than just helping get the transaction done. Yeah, I think that there is a lot of real estate agents who have this misconception that once they get their license, they're granola or like very like brand new to it. Right. And what they're lacking is the realization that they just went through 120 hours of schooling that did nothing to prep them for an actual transaction. If we're being completely honest, honest. Yes, yeah. which we are, you couldn't pass but the test today. I couldn't pass the test today. Absolutely right? not. No. And, and, and we move a lot of inventory. Yeah. Yeah. But, that's what that's what I mean is they feel like they don't have confidence going into things because one, the lack of that training, right? Real life experience. But they think that other people, it's just this automatic assumption that other people outside of the industry know more about real estate than they do, which they don't. Well, yeah, and I would even go further to further than that saying they don't have the confidence going into the transaction, comma but they're still going to go through with the transaction. Yeah, this they're is They're not an turning action they're business. not turning around. They're not turning away a 3% commission because they lack the confidence. So then you see people getting themselves in these situations that they never should have been in when purchasing a house. Absolutely. And it, it's like that's my pet peeve and I think that that's a huge motivation for me. Uh, there's two audiences that we're noticing that are starting to watch this show. Number one is real estate agents because I think real estate agents like learning from other real estate agents. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were a new real estate agent, an up and coming real estate agent, and you want to hear what some of the absolute best of the best are doing, this is a great show to tune into because you're getting to see kind of who they are behind the transaction and, and outside of the transaction. But then number two, I want buyers and sellers to be able to listen and if, they're, if it comes down to three agents, I want them to get an idea of who these people are mm -hmm. because I think that there are so many not good good agents out there that it, it's almost like offensive to me because I love real estate and I love everything that it can do. And like, I am a firm believer in real estate as an investment vehicle, as investment properties, but then also investing into your life and having a place to live, right? That transaction, not only is it not supposed to be terrible, it should be enjoyable. It should be something that you're excited about. It should be the start of a journey that you are excited about. And that agent, I think, can often make or break it. And so I'm almost like hellbent on showcasing who some of those best agents are out there for those tra types of transactions. Yeah, I think that you brought up a couple great points. Mostly that this business is an action business. Yep, and very much so. there are people out there who lack the confidence to take action. But the way that I look at it, and now what I'm doing is a lot of mental motivation and, and how to change your mindset because I'm in leadership, right? I have to help these people go through the roller coaster, which is real estate and have to help them understand that they're not the only one and that it's probably not going to be over, right? They just have to have the right mindset about it. Now it's the same thing with telling your wife or girlfriend or friend something that you don't want to tell them. There's always a way to say something and there's always a way to do something. It's just how you go about it that makes it a great or a horrible outcome. And so the mindset around real estate right how, now. Sorry, how much would you say that you think, in your opinion, the agent dictates if it's a good transaction or not? You've worked with tons of different buyers. You've worked with tons of different agents. Yeah. What percentage of you or what percentage would you attribute to, to that being a bad experience versus a good experience directly to the agent? So are you, are you wanting the answer related to what I feel like? Yeah, personal opinion. Like what... I, and I think that this says a lot about how you run your business, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if your opinion is that the agent doesn't dictate what the transaction is, the buyer or seller does, I think you're wrong. Because I think that if you are, uh, we had uh, Kenny Sperry on here last episode. If you were done to deal with Kenny, I think he absolutely crushes it. But he talked about how he wanted to be an advisor, mm -hmm. right? And if you, if you take that role, like an advisory role from an agent standpoint and being good at what you do, which I know is important to you and how you run your business, you are not afraid to have that pressure of the transaction being good on your shoulders. Yeah, no, I think that it is very much so on the real estate agent 
Um, and here's where I see a lot of people go wrong. They take, look, this is an emotional roller coaster for absolutely everybody involved. And for those real estate agents who say, no, I'm just, I'm the back end, I'm the emotionless. They're lying, right? They are emotional. It even is a roller in, coaster. Even investors that are not like looking at a house or a flip or anything like that to move into and raise their kids and have the Christmas tree in the corner. They're looking and sort of saying, hey, I want to invest in this property because this is my daughter's graduation present. Mm -hmm. This is what puts my daughter through college. This is what puts my son through medical school. This is like there, there's still so much emotion wrapped up in purchases of real estate, even even on investment properties. Right. Yeah. And, and even on the agent side. Yes. But here's here's where a lot of people go wrong. They emote those emotions or they they project those emotions onto their client, which therefore creates a horrible experience for everyone involved. Your job as a real estate agent is to take all of that stress, all of those emotions that are going on, your clients, yours, everybody else's, manage them and only dictate what you say in a positive way. That That's what creates a positive experience, right? It is all on you because I could make, tomorrow I could make a transaction be absolutely horrible yeah. for everyone involved. Or I can make that choice and have the mindset that this is my job to advise them. I'm almost like a counselor. It's taking it in and not throwing it right back because then that creates an explosion of emotion and it's just horrible. Well, so you've been in the business now how long? This is five and a half years. And we haven't even done an intro yet and we're 11 minutes in. So ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we got Tim Leary. Irish? Tim, Tim, Tim O'Leary? It's Timothy Flynn Leary. Timothy Flynn Leary. Yeah. In the podcast. And we've been talking a lot about what it means to be good at what you do, I think, right? Like that's, yeah, that's kind of know. like what, what it boils <laughs> down to. And, and this is, this is the sound of an experienced agent of a mature agent of an agent that's gone through a very difficult market in the last two years. It's been a good market, but don't get me wrong. It has been a difficult market if you're not in it and, and around it and, and partaking in the market. So tell us a little bit about how you got here, mostly from the beginning before you were licensed, what you were doing, what life looked like, what was it that, that, that helped you get started in real estate and where was your mindset going in? Yeah. So I have a very long story, but I'll give you the short form. When I was in high school, I was never diagnosed with ADD, didn't recognize it. I don't think it was very talked about. And so I went through all of no, high it was school. Like a, it was a, it was like a dark cloud. Like yeah. the kids that like, I think struggled with it. Like their parents apologized for him. Yeah. And <laughs> like, it's funny. I'm sorry. Like no, I, mm, I was, I that, was, that was the stigma I would say around it. Yeah. And I was told many times that it's, it's my lack of diligence when in reality it just was, a yeah, it wasn't that you were putting the time in. It was, it, it was, there's a whole bunch of excuses, right? Yeah. And, and that's exactly what it was is it, I was coming up with excuses, right. That weren't actually excuses, but to everybody else they were. So I just said, screw it. This is my life then. So I just have to deal with it. So I did. And I failed multiple classes in high school and had to do all of them my senior year to make up for it. I had like a one point something GPA in high school. Like it was, it was no bueno. What'd you get on the ACT? Uh, uh you really want to know? Yeah. I got a 16. I got a 17. So thank you. <laughs> that helps. That makes me feel better. Like I wasn't the complete dumbass on the show. Thank you. Yeah. But cheers to the 17s. Cheers huh? to the 16s. Hey, <laughs> they're out there. Um, where, where I transitioned though, is I played baseball. And so that was kind of my saving grace. Uh, I was denied by about every school I just applied to. Cause you had a 1.8 GPA. Yeah. And so I had to get into school another way and that was through baseball. So I was able to play college baseball. I was hurt. So I decided to come back to Utah and my sophomore year of college, I fell right back into the same trap. Baseball created that structure and that accountability that I needed. Yeah. And it, like motivation almost, right? Like yeah, that was, was like what you were trying to live your life to be. Correct. And it was outside. When, you, earlier you talked about harmony, right? And finding that harmony in your life. Would you say baseball was kind of the harmony to that? Yeah. It was just like um, a great question is looking back at your longest relationship with something, not with someone, with something and recognizing your life and what it was while you were doing that. So Melanie, my girlfriend asked me, what is that? What in your life did you do for the longest amount of time that you don't pay any attention to anymore? And it was baseball. And it brought up a really good point of reflecting back on why I was doing so well while I was playing baseball mentally. Why were you in happiness. alignment? Yeah. Yeah. And it was because I had these goals and, and aspirations, right. That could counterbalance my ADD in school. I was good at something else 
Therefore, I had to be good at school in order to when play baseball. When your focus baseball. becomes on baseball, which is not a part of school, but school naturally comes with it. You, you can't right? fail in school in order to play baseball. Yeah. They go hand in hand, and that's that harmony of finding something that you super, super enjoy, whether it be within or outside of work, and creating that harmony between the two so that you have something to look forward to. And so through college, I actually dropped out of college because I stopped playing baseball. I'm not quite sure I went into depression. I've always been a very happy person, but I just was lost completely. So I started bartending and working at a restaurant in Salt Lake. To make ends meet, did you think there was something there? Uh, to be completely honest, I had no <clears throat> desire to do anything in life. Like, but I you just, had to do something, right? Yeah, it was almost just like, what's going to pay the bills to live whatever life I'm currently living? It, it had no, I had no aspirations to be rich. I had no, it just was never, a, I don't know, it was never talked about. I ne nobody ever asked me what I want to do. It was always just like, are you going to go back to school? Are you going to go back to school? Until. Which you probably in your mind linked to baseball, right? And so there's kind well, of yeah. like this D-Day coming of like, hey, baseball ends at some point. Well, I got hurt, so I yeah. couldn't physically play baseball anymore. Still to this day, I cannot throw a baseball, right? Like I, I just, you can't make it to the pros without being able to throw. Yeah. So it got to the point where I just didn't necessarily have something I was super motivated by. And a gentleman would walk in and he was a regular Tuesday at 1030 for lunch. And he'd get a slice of pizza and a drink. And he would, I think the bill was maybe $5. And he would leave me a $20 tip every time. So I just started like processing like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's different. It's different. A 400% a a tip is yeah. different. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, that's when I started articulating money to certain like different areas. It wasn't just $20. It was 400% yeah. or whatever that percentage is, right? And recognizing, oh, that's a massive return for that guy to give me $20. It's not just 20 bucks, right? If you have a million dollars and you give away 20, it's essentially nothing. But the difference between giving away $5 for your meal and $20 because... Correct. The kid bartending... Yeah. And Talk so to you, whatever reason he saw, right? So through all of that, there was a company that came to our, our restaurant and rented out the whole restaurant. And I was selected to be his personal kind of waiter assistant that whole evening. And I think I got a thousand dollar tip. And so it just money started to like become more affluent in my life. Like it just became very apparent that money is relatable to things that I enjoyed doing. And that Which became, is different than saying you're motivated by money. Correct. You're motivated by doing those things that you had to have money to get. Yeah. Could I be happy without it? hundred percent because I was happy, but it came down to the point where I didn't have a car cause I couldn't afford it. Yeah. Uh, maxed out all my credit cards. So I have horrible credit maxed out. Uh, you know, I was riding a skateboard to work, uh, through all seasons in summer, like at what winter. age? This was 20, 21, 22. Yeah. So with real life, whatever that is coming down the barrel of a gun. Yeah. I mean, it was point, all right? very, very, very real and very apparent, but that attachment to money became my harmony. Just like baseball. It replaced school. baseball. Yes. Now I wanted to be someone, but I still had no idea how. So who was the mystery man? Was he a real estate agent? Was he, he is, I will absolutely okay. plug him because he, um, to this day, like, you know, it's not that we stay in touch all the time, but, um, we bumped into each other the other day and it was a very, very amazing moment for me to reflect back on. His name's Mark Rogers and Mark Rogers still sells real estate in Salt Lake. Um, I am, it's, it's bad of me to say I haven't followed up enough and stayed in contact enough to know exactly how he's doing, what he's doing, but I know he's still selling real estate. I think he owns his own brokerage. So he, ins he inspired me by giving me that $20 tip, but it wasn't just once it was every day consistently. And he would casually, very casually, as he was walking out the door, just ask what I wanted to do. And it was never to get the right answer. And it he was, was the never, first person to ask you that you said, yeah. And it became this relationship that blossomed into, I can't afford real estate school. You're telling me to go do real estate. Well, can we put that into perspective for a second? Real estate school is like 500 bucks. Yeah. Real estate school is like 500 bucks and 120 hours. So like you were, I was broke. So, so you're broke. I was broke. You're um, trying to figure out how to find four or $500 to do your 120 hours of online school. Yeah. But again, it was, it was relative. Did I want to do it? No, I had no idea what to, in, to expect or anticipate. So, um, he just said, I'll, I'll pay for it. And he slid his credit card over and he said, your tip today is going to be real estate school. I had a laptop, so I pulled it out behind the bar, signed up for real estate school. Put his credit card info in. Put his credit card cool information dude. in. Seriously. And that's one it, of the cooler stories I've heard so far. Yeah. And it just got to the point where I mean, I, I started classes, I started going through the online schooling. Like I just started doing it. And truthfully, Melanie, 
came into my life right at that moment where I kind of was fizzling back out, right? Because he was telling me how much money he makes, like all these things. And I just started, I guess, disassociating with money again because I didn't have any. So it was and exciting. And it probably seemed really far out of, out of reach at that point too, That's, right? So that, that goes into my why now. Yeah. Is I feel like I'm incredibly relatable to a lot of people. Therefore, I can be a vehicle for them to, to find success because they can associate and attach themselves to me and my story and even who I am now. I'll never I've, lose sight yeah, of that. I've always said that I am perfectly okay if people look at me and say, okay, well, if Boo did it, I can do it. Like, I've talked to Boo, and if Boo can do this, yeah. then I can do it. Like, I let me be that person. From class clown to school yeah. failure to being broke. To Were you now, a good bartender? I was a great bartender. Yeah. But guess why? It's not not my personality, but I just had that ability to, yeah. to make people feel comfortable and happy. Well, there's probably some, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into that, right? Yeah. So anyways, fast forward, I, I met Melanie and, um, you, you know. You go through school. I went through school, but I went through school and finished school in two weeks because uh, I just needed a better life for her. Like I fell in love with her the second I saw her and recognized, uh-oh. <laughs> I can't. She's not going to fall in love with a bartender. She, she's like not that. getting on the yeah. back of my skateboard to yeah. go to our first date. I got to figure this shit out. And you're not 16 anymore. So that's not cute, right? Not it's at not, all. It's not cute that you're 21. Not at all. Riding your skateboard to the bar mm -hmm. during Christmas time. It's fun to look back at where I am now, where her and I are at now, where my family's at now to when we very first met and we call, we call me bartender Tim sometimes. And that's just, it's a reflection of where we came from. Yeah. Right. It's a reflection of a time in my life where I was incredibly happy, but at the same time I needed to do more. And so she was that bridge. So then I started selling real estate. And so what was the switch when you were like, okay, enough is enough. Was it a single day? Was it a moment? Was it like, I, uh, you went on a date with Mel and all of a sudden you're riding home on your skateboard and you're like, this ends now. Like what, do you remember that moment? Was it a moment or was it just over time? You're like, okay, this is done. It, I, it, it was over time because when I got my real estate license, I was able to Which actually, was, sorry, what year? How long ago would that have been? 2017. Yeah. I was actually in a place, in an environment where people around me were incredibly wealthy. So it was no longer the bar. It was no longer like the taboo to ask someone how much money they make. I was in an environment where it was incredibly open. And that's why I am incredibly open about my financial life. Because that inspired me to recognize, yeah. hey, if Boo can do it, I can do it. Yeah. Or if Tim can do it, I can do it. And so why I'm in leadership now. So fast forward, I, I have been selling real estate for five years, five and a half years. Well, let's back up just a little bit because I want to hear what that first year went like. Because um, that yeah. first year is tough. Yeah. It's a, it, like that first, I, I think it takes two to really start feeling comfortable, like enough to start like tweaking your business. But I think those first year, at least first year to 18 months, is you just kind of getting your ass kicked saying that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's that shapes a ton of what your business looks like now five years later. Yeah, so I have uh, incredibly high conversion ratios for online leads. And that's how I got started. You know, of course it was the open houses. Of course it was like... Doing all the things that every other real estate agent You have does. to do them. Yeah. But my bread and butter is online leads. And back in the day it was hilarious because we would get made fun of, uh, you know, I would come home from a closing or come back to the office from a closing. And it was always like, Oh, you know, you didn't work for that lead. And I was like, I got money in my bank account. So sure feels honestly, like I worked who for cares? Yeah. You know, like I did work for him and I know it, my client knows it, but from the outsider, it was an easy deal. Um, super, super not easy. Right. So yeah. my first year I made $115,000 in six months. And then <laughs> I wish I could say, and then I made another, uh, and then I just stopped working. That year like, oh, you made $115,000. Yeah, so th then the yeah. whole rest of the year I made yeah. that. But um, that was, I was 21. You kind of pushed it too far and like all of a sudden you got that money and you could leave a $20 tip. And then all of a sudden you're like, uh, this started, is not a sustainable business. Yeah. And, you know, truthfully, I started doing that, leaving tips and, and helping homeless people and helping my family and buying cars and doing whatever I thought was what you needed to do. Um, a common misconception is looking at someone like me or you now, boo, and having someone who's brand new in the industry think that they can also go buy that car or they can also go buy that house. We worked for five years. You've worked for X amount of years. My mentors. I got licensed for, in 2016, so I'm about a year ahead of you. Like, yeah. Been in it about the same time, right? My mentors who've been in it for 25 years, I cannot go buy the cars that they buy. 
right? Yeah. So this, there's that misconception within real estate yeah, or sales in general where you can if you don't want to invest back in your business. I think right if you're making it 115, that, that's I think that was that's like what was a big one for me early on is all of this everything that you're seeing is me reinvesting back into my business. Mm-hmm. It costs more than the cars does. It costs more than the house does. It costs more than the shoes does. It it. And I think that's where there's a huge disconnect between agents that come in and make $120,000 in their first six months to a year, which is big numbers. And then there's a reason why five or six years later, they're still making the same amount of money. It's because they don't reinvest that back into their business. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I made that mistake. And again, there's all these little nuggets of why I'm in leadership now and why I find my passion there. It's because I, you don't have to make the same mistakes I made. You know, you will make mistakes. There'll be your own, but hopefully they're not as detrimental as mine was you know, or were mine were where I made $115,000 and then spent $115,000 and then made $150,000 and then spent $150,000. Yeah. And it hit me when I accidentally left a paycheck on my counter and Mel saw it, who was working harder than I was, who was in school, who was doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing. And I think that check was like $11,000 to the point where I had just forgotten about it. And a lot of people are probably like, wow, what a, D bag, like he forgot that he had 11 grand sitting there. It wasn't that it was because I had no business concept. I had nobody it to didn't guide mean, me. Now that 11 grand is 11 grand that you can reinvest back into your clients, into your business, into the agents that support you. That However 11, you it, want. it means more to you now than it did, even though you're probably making more now, right? We're not, I'm not trying to get into your, your number, your numbers currently. I'm guessing you're making more now than you yeah. were back then, mm-hmm. but that money means more to you now. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more, I call it adulthood to it. Yeah. There's a lot more um, business that goes into that money and and less, I wouldn't even say fun because I love what I do, but I'm not buying crazy cars anymore. I'm not buying a million houses that are a bad investment. Like there's, there's Wait, things I that hear I'm doing. Mel, I want to hear what Mel said to you because I, I, oh, she's, yeah. she's a, <laughs> she she'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. she'll let you know. Um, she saw it and said, why the hell am I paying half of rent? That was number one. <laughs> you had her paying half the rent. I think that was. But again, it was a misconception. I just, I didn't have any association with the money I was making. So I just went through life thinking, oh yeah, well, if we're living together, there's two of us, you pay yeah. half, I pay half. If we go to the grocery store, you pay half, I pay half. So Melanie, who was in school, who hasn't started her own business, who has, you know, there's things that she hasn't done that I, at that point I had, was teaching me these incredible lessons through communication about you have to do something with this money, you know? And it wasn't Tim, go invest this money back in your business. It was, I can't believe that you're going to let this sit here and do nothing. Well, and all of a sudden, whatever car you were driving was more offensive to her than everything th- Everything w- that you, because she was killing herself to try to make it work. Yeah. And let's put it into perspective. It was a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So she was paying 500. I was paying 500. Right. I could have paid the whole year in that one paycheck for both of us. Yeah. But I didn't understand and your it. relationship survived after that. Yes. Because okay, we're gonna transition this podcast into <laughs> relationships. One Oh one. How Tim, Tim got through that. What Tim just described. Let me break this down for everybody at home. Number one, Tim had his girlfriend paying half the rent. <laughs> also, his girlfriend is more beautiful than what you are like thinking in his mind. In your mind. Like the, it's not like it's, this is like a very real, like I need everybody that's listening to understand Tim has this beautiful girl that got pissed at him because she's paying half the rent while he is making six figures. Okay. Yeah. So now uh, relationships one hundred dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. So from that conversation, she asked me how much money I made. And that were was, you embarrassed to tell her? Um, at that point, yeah, because yeah. it was right after she was like, I can't believe that, you know. But she comes from a very conservative family, like a very um very Southern hospitality, like yeah. very put together, very uh, like amazing, amazing family, very like well put together. Yeah. And so it was taboo for her to ask me. And she, I know she was uncomfortable. I, can we talk about that for 30 seconds? Unrelated. Yes. I don't understand. It, it's, there's a fine line here. Hold on. I have something to say about this. There's a fine line between bragging about how much you make mm-hmm. and having it be realistic. And I think one of my favorite things about our, you're, you're 29, 27, 27. So you're two years younger than me, but this generation, this kind of, there's there's a generation that I would say is 10 to 15 years older where it, it was you don't talk about it mm-hmm. and then you have people that are like are going to college trying to get a job and they don't know what they should be asking for they don't know how much they should be trying to make mm-hmm. so then you had a bunch of people that were just a little bit older than us that went to college and like what the hell was that man yeah 
I was supposed to make all this money afterwards. It's because nobody talked about it. Why do you think that's taboo? And I think as real estate um, agents, we all get really comfortable talking about it because you have to ask people if they can afford what we're shopping for. Mm -hmm. You have to ask about that in a really nice way that doesn't make you look like an asshole that just showed up in a BMW, right? You have to be good at having that conversation of, of do you qualify for this house? Yeah. Right? So why do you think that that's like such a weird area for people to talk about? Uh, my assumption would be that there's two sides to it or they think of it as two sides. You're either doing well and it's bragging or you're not doing well and it's embarrassing. Yeah. But what our generation has created is the comfort in being happy with life, I would say, yeah. versus money. But there's still part of us that want that money. Yeah, there's. I think that for the first time, we're kind of having the conversation of money is a portion of what is leading to your happiness. But if you don't have that harmony, if you don't have baseball, if you don't have whatever is on that other side for you, right? We talk about that on every episode. We try to talk about, and we'll talk about this towards the end, but we, we want to know who you are on both ends of real estate at the beginning of your real estate journey and then outside of real estate. Because mm -hmm. that that is so much a part of, of having that harmony. Yeah. Right. But, but realizing that money is not everything, but it's still this. And this is what is, I think is different is when people would say, how much money do you make? They would say, well, money doesn't matter, which is technically true, but also it's a giant lie. Yeah. Because if they're making $10 million, yeah, money doesn't oh, matter. Of course they're saying money <laughs> doesn't matter. Right. But at the same time too, if you can say, Hey, I am happy, I'm making money, but that's a portion of what leads to my happiness. Mm-hmm. That's, I think, when, when you can actually have that harmony. Because if money is out of whack, it's no different than hating what you do every single day. Yeah, it goes back to me saying, uh, you know, there's a way to ask every question. Yeah. And there's there doesn't have to be a barrier or it doesn't have to be taboo. I would say no question. If you want to come up to me on the streets and ask me a question, not one is off the table. Yeah. It's just how you approach it. So You better be okay with whatever answer comes back, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I put myself in that position. Yeah. So here's what I... A lot of my friends... I know how much money their parents make and they don't know how much money their parents make because I asked and it goes, that falls right into real estate and what I teach in real estate. You have to ask for the business. You have to because, every single time because people don't understand what is next. They don't know what the next steps are. Now, if I would have said, Hey, how much money do you make? There would be a hesitation. But if I say, Hey, I'm really trying to figure out my life. I'm really what trying to I'm figure out where I'm going. Why? I, right. Do I want to get into real estate? Cause I've watched selling sunset and it looks like you can make a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can make a bunch of money in real estate. Let me tell you what it looks like to make a bunch of money in real estate though. Yeah. And I would ask people who I wanted their life. Yeah. I, I would see their, their, uh, the perception of their life. At success least. leaves clues. Yeah. Right. So whatever, whatever part of their life that you saw successful, you're like, okay, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. And whether it was perception or not, I wanted to know that if I made X amount of money, over the course of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I could have what I'm visually seeing right now in front of me. So, so I was that part of the life. conversation that you had to have with Mel? Yes. At some point, like when she started saying like, but it probably forced you to have that conversation for maybe the first time in your lifetime, right? Yeah, I was on the other end of it. Yeah. And so she asked me, I told her, and then she said, how much do you have? That's a worse question to ask somebody that was in your, <laughs> I've been there. I've been there. So cool, Tim, you made $115,000. How much do you have? And I looked at her and I said, well, I have that $11,000 that is in your hand right now. Can I have it back? <laughs> yeah, I need that. Yeah. Um, and she said, if I made $115,000 right now and you asked me how much I had, I would say $105,000. Because of how much she was living on at the time. Mm -hmm. So she would have saved 105 grand based on real actual facts of what her fixed income or sorry, her fixed expenses were over the course of 12 months. So her how fixed nice was expenses, your fancy car at that point? I drove a Tesla. Yeah. Brand new Model 3. Like it was right when Model 3s came out. And that's not what impressed her? Uh, no. You know yeah. what impresses her today? So... Yes, I'm, I find myself to be very successful. I'm proud of everything I've accomplished and, and what's to come. Uh, you're aware of what it took to accomplish I'm a, it. I'm now aware yeah. of all of that. And my car now is a third of the price than what that Tesla was when I had no money. But we talked about this, I, and I know you, so I'm going to like lead into this just a little bit. Mm -hmm. What did you do with your extra money in the last 12 months? Last 12 months, reinvested it. Into my your, business. Yeah. 
And a portion of that, specifically, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get something specific, so I'll just oh, okay. hit it yeah. on the head. Oh, yeah. If you had spent the money <clears throat> on the stupid stuff that you were prior to, you're not buying your grandma's house. No. Which I think has meant more to you than any other portion of your business, if I had to guess. Yeah. And, you know, the cool part is I don't feel like I have to go and tell people how much I paid for the house. Yeah. Because here's what you get. You get a 27-year-old and a 24-year-old who look like we're both 16 living in a, a house that I would say is the nicest in the entire neighborhood. And you know exactly what everyone else is thinking who's yeah. lived there forever or worked their ass off to be, right? Oh, they got it for free because it was his grandma's house. And the coolest part of where I am now in my life and my career, which is harmony, you don't is care. that I don't care. You don't care what they say. I don't care if they yeah. think I got it for free because guess what? You're very aware of what it I took for you to be sitting shit. your ass in that seat. What matters yeah. is between the walls of me and my family. And that's it. And so I've now positioned myself to where I can calmly, collectively help everyone who wants to be helped. And I don't care about that fame anymore. Right. There's a difference between fortune and fame. And a lot of people think fame brings fortune. And in reality, fortune brings fame. Yeah. And the best part is that you're not achieving something that's no good for the world. You're achieving something and working hard to create that fortune for you and your family, which therefore translates into fame. The reason it translates into fame is because people appreciate where you've gone, how far you've come. Then you can share your story, which creates that fame because everyone all of a sudden starts to realize I can do that too. Well, so tell us a little bit more about that, right? What does it look like to now work with you as an agent versus we got, we got, I, I don't want to say discombobulated because I'm sure that you were still just as good back then as you are now. Mm -hmm. You're more refined now. You're, Far you're more, refined. you're more dialed in. You're more specific. You're more deliberate. I would say yeah. in what you do, mm -hmm. what, what does it feel like for somebody to be a client of yours? So truthfully, I think I bring a lot of value in terms of what can happen and what you can do with real estate as a whole. And it's much more of a holistic approach versus a transaction. So I guess what I would, what I mean by that is a lot of my clients have come out of our transactions and texted me saying, okay, now it's time to invest in real estate. So what I've done is provided enough value, advice, support, whatever you want to call it to kind of expand their horizons as well. So it's, it's less of a transaction. It's less even like of a friendship. Like that's, that's my bread and butter is creating rapport and, and friendships with people. Yeah. But it allows, I think a transaction with me allows you to start discovering more about yourself that you didn't know in regard to what your future can look like. Where do you think that, where do you think that comes from? Is that like, is that, does that mirror what your, that was my experience. Yeah. Is that like what, yeah. Is that what, is that what kind of prompted you or, or started you that like, that's going back to the conversation that we had talked about earlier with Mel, that's kind of the conversation that you had to start taking place when all of a sudden she's like, it, I would have had $105,000 left in the bank because yeah. she had her expenses down. She had her, she handled her business from a structural standpoint that you probably had not seen. Right. Yeah. So, you know, through my transition into from bartending to real estate, to leadership, to owning a team, right. It's, it's been a really cool transition, but I've reflected and recognized that if I, if no one ever gave me the opportunity to explore different horizons, I would not be where I am today. A lot of people go through life a lot, like large, large percentage of people go through life yeah. just doing what they feel like they have to do, right? They don't understand. Nobody has ever approached them with what's next. And, and not only that, but why are you doing this? And what it can do for you. Yes. So working with me, in my experience, because of what I went through to get to where I am, I'm not saying it was like this crazy sob story, but because of what I no, went through. No, you're, but you've been in the business longer than the average agent stays in the business. Yeah. Something has to give, something has to change, especially from that first year. Because that first year that you described is, is two things. Number one, it's very common. I hear real estate agents, oh, excuse me, sorry, Mike, didn't mean to do that to you. In the first year, I did the same thing. I remember I got my, my 1099 at the end of the year and I was like, Wait, I made how much? <laughs> Where did this go? Yeah. And not in like a disrespectful, like, I, I, you know what? Let's call it disrespectful because I was being disrespectful to money and I was being disrespectful to to the things that, that I had to do to get there. I wasn't as self-aware now of like what it takes to actually get to some point, mm -hmm. right? And so 
there has to have so sorry that it's very common that story is not uncommon and you but it's also not sustainable if if that is your business model you will get beat out by the elites that you and i both know and have rubbed shoulders with and, and spent time with you will get beat out by spring you will get beat out by somebody that takes it more seriously and at a higher level than you do that's the beautiful part about capitalism and the beautiful part about real estate agents and that's the beautiful part i think about not working with that bottom 25 percent of people that do one transaction or less every single year right that's the beautiful part about working with the people that we're having on this show is that the only reason that they are sitting in that seat is because they, they are better than they were in year one and they are different than they were in year one. Yeah. Yeah. Through that transaction or sorry, through that transition of year one. And it is a big deal, right? It does take a lot. It does. It takes a ton of like kicking your own ass and saying, there's a better way to do this. There's a lot of hard conversations with Mel saying, Hey, it, you could have gone one of two ways in that conversation. You could have said, yes, let me show you what it's like to live this lifestyle. Or number two, Let's double down and figure out how we can go and buy my grandma's house when it comes available in a freak sale because I want to make sure I have money put away and I want to run my business in a way that allows me to do what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. And so through all of that, my mentors, uh, my financial advisors, my mom, my dad, everyone who could, I started to look at each of them with a different perspective and I started to associate where they started and where they were now and it all came down to someone, a person, whoever that person might be within their life, help them explore the other opportunities that nobody else had. That's what I do. I'm able to help these people understand what they have never been told, what they've never experienced, what they never knew was possible through real estate. It's my vehicle. I don't even think I, I am a real estate agent on paper. Um, I don't know what I would call myself. Right. I, I couldn't put a word to it. But what I what I do is I look back and reflect on my five years or where I even started to where I am now before real estate. And I try and help people find that same vision or break through their thermostat. Right. Everyone has a thermostat. How can everyone you has a risk it? tolerance that they're comfortable with? Yeah. yeah. And and so they're never in an environment or a conversation where people break through it because your comfort like that's who you hang out so with. So would you say it's a pressure? It's not, it's not pressure. That's oh God, not the no. right word. No, because it, I have it, it, so No, and many... I, I'm not saying it's high pressure. Like you have to do this right now, but it's also not just going to be a pointless transaction for you. No. You take it very seriously. I think is what I'm trying to say. Like yeah, there's a lot you're of. You're going to have honest conversations. If a seller comes to you and says, I want to list my house for 2 million. And you're like, this is worth one, right? Like you, you, there's a lot of people that say, yeah, let's try and do that. Let's try and do that. Let's try and do that. Cause they're so desperate to get the business that they don't thoroughly explain to, to buyers or sellers the situation that they are actually in. Yeah, I, I would not help someone purchase or sell real estate if I didn't, if like I wouldn't do it myself. Like if I wouldn't, if I was that person and they want to sell their house for $2 million and it's only worth a million, I'm not helping them, right? What I will help them is understanding the actual value of their home and understanding you know, that maybe you should stay in it for a little longer because you could get 2 million and I don't know how long. But what I do is I just really, 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 really dive into creating a, a space that people never knew existed and then they get to do what they want with it. I'll never tell someone what to do because if they go and do it and it fails, guess what? That's on me. But you also, and this is a fine line that you have to walk, you also have to let people know, I call it the reality of the situation that you have to let them know where they are actually at in, in relationship to the world. You have to help give them that perspective that that new purchase just gave. This is what right? it's almost saying. This is what I would do if I was in that situation. And here's how you can accomplish it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I provide a platform for them to recognize what's possible in life and what's possible in their personal or business life or financial life in the future by through, through buying a home, whether it be a personal home, investment properties, flipping house, like it, it doesn't matter. Right. That's why I don't associate myself with just a real estate agent. I'm just creating opportunity for other people to explore opportunities that they never thought were possible. And my vehicle is selling real estate. So what, what is it in your life now that brings you harmony? My home life, which is, so I was actually on a phone call today with a, a long-term friend of mine and the conversation was revolving on like, yeah, like, what, what do you like to do for fun? What's your hobby? And the cool part is balance 
you have hobbies that are fully disassociated with your work and then you have work, right? Harmony is everything I do in my personal life has some sort of relation to business. But it, again, it's how you approach it. So when I'm home, I'm fully confident and comfortable to put my phone away for the evening and, and spend that time with Mel. And you're okay with the consequences of that. 100%. If someone calls you and doesn't want to work with you because you were hanging out with Mel and not answering your phone at 8 o'clock at night, you're okay with them not working with you. 100%. And it goes the opposite way. If someone calls that I know I need to answer that phone call, I answer the phone call, right? And that's the blessing that I have is my life, my hobby, my passion, my joy, my happiness comes from Mel and my family and work. And they're all associated with one another perfectly. So I'm able to go and have fun. I'm able to work. I'm able to go live in a different state for three months if I want and work, right? But it's providing other opportunities for Mel or my family. If I want to go live in Boston for a month, I'm going to go live in Boston for a month, right? Now, yes, would I need to put a bunch of things in place prior to doing that? 100%. Is it an option though? It's always yes. an option. And then what that does for Mel is creates a whole new life that she might have not ever thought was imaginable or being able to go boating with my mom, right? Creates that environment where we can spend so much time and, and just be with one another. But at the same time, like I know that work is handled. So I don't know if that was your question. Yeah, no, that, yeah. What is, what does the harmony look like outside of, outside of real estate? Cause I think the agents that have that, that harmony outside of real estate and still live their life with real estate, not despite real estate. Those are the agents that I think should be being worked with the most. Yeah. Because look, I, I worked in park city at Sotheby's for a couple of years. And one of the coolest aspects about that job is uh, to each their own, but no one wore a suit and tie, right? Everyone was in Patagonia driving Subarus, right? It was, it's Park City. Yeah. But the coolest thing is I texted one of my fellow agents up there because I, I was going to go show her listing. And I got a text back, an automatic reply saying, hey, I'm skiing. I'll get back to you after one o'clock. Every single person that I work with in Salt Lake or anywhere, truthfully, if they're new in the business, would never dare have Set an automatic text, text that Hell gets no. sent that way. Yeah. The coolest part and what I learned from that experience, and literally that one experience of the producing getting agent, that text, I'm guessing, right? The producing agent, yeah. the number one agent. Yeah. I got that text and I immediately realized I can do everything I want to do as long as they harmonize together and there's a blend. So my life is entirely blended so in my eyes perfectly that I can be incredibly successful. I can work 80 to 100 hours a week if I wanted to and still have the exact same home life that I want, the exact same travel life that I want, the exact same everything, right? Because it's blended so perfectly. But it took time to get there. And most importantly, I think it took confidence to get there because I commit to those who commit to me and vice versa. What I... I, I you attach something to that when you said that it's blended perfectly. You said it's blended perfectly together in my eyes. Yeah. Because to other people, it is very out of whack, I'm guessing. To oh, other my people, mother looks at me and she's yeah. like, dude, stop. Stop working or stop this. But you found that harmony in, in yours and Mel's life to where what you're doing is a part of it, not something that you do and then this other portion of your life takes over. Yeah, right when I got into real estate, um, a friend of mine at Sotheby's in Park City, actually, who was kind of my mentor getting into this, told me I've never missed a baseball game. I've never missed a performance. I've never missed a birthday because I have harmony within business and life. And I can tell you, honestly, I have never missed any of those things. Yeah, I've never once had to miss any of those things. And the coolest part is not a single client, a single coworker, a single CEO, boss, whoever you want to put in my world has, would ever has question had an it. issue with it. Never. Yeah. Because of the confidence going into it yeah. and just knowing that, Hey, I'm going to commit to you guys. I will be here. I will work. I will produce. I will do everything that I'm supposed to and do. And me spending time with my girlfriend or me spending time skiing or me spending time renovating my grandma's house. that's completely nostalgic to me. All is fits not going it. to slow any of that down. It's all together. Yeah. It's all the same. Yeah. So people disassociate things and they separate things completely. And that's where you don't ever, you can never be amazing at all of these different things. Right. I mean, there are some outliers, but like I can't go be a major league baseball player, a professional real estate agent, run a real estate team, be a speaker over here, be a professional scuba diver. I just be can't a boyfriend. do that. Be a boyfriend. Yeah. I can't do any of that. Right. 
if they're all separate, but if they're all together, it's just one thing and I can be freaking amazing at it. So I can be amazing at my personal life because it's connected to my work life. I can be amazing at my work life. And they help build the other one. All of it. Yeah. Everything is associated and put together to where it can just build off of one another. Well, we appreciate you coming on because that's, that's a lot deeper of a perspective. And I think a lot of real estate agents have. Thank you, boo. Of course. I love you. What's the best way for someone to get a hold of you? Uh, You can follow me on social media. Uh, Tim Flynn underscore. I think there will be a, a link. Or we'll something. link it all. And then my hold your website. hand up like this, and we'll have Jonah put this. His don't information mess up, right Jonah. <laughs> Wait, right here, right here. You get you get to choose. And then my website is timlearyhomes dot com. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. We'll link everything. We appreciate you coming on, man. Thanks, Boo. Hopefully, I can come back. Of course. <laughs>